Hello and welcome to this episode of the Disaster Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Davis, and we are here to bring you this live segment that we recorded at the Nature Preparedness Summit in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, Sam Bradley got to sit down and chat with some folks in a variety of topics having to do with disasters and preparedness over the course of this conference. And we're bringing you yet another segment from that thing. And of course, wouldn't be a disaster podcast episode if it wasn't for our good friend, Sam Bradley, joining us. Hi, Sam. Thank you, Jamie. Today was a lot about communication and the importance of communication in disaster, from ham radio to social media to all kinds of other things. So it was very interesting discussions today. It seemed to be a theme running through. Uh, yes, it, the it wasn't intentional, today. but it, it, it just worked out was. that way. Yeah, it did. Just a great conference, though, overall. It just, and a variety of people from local and county public health agencies here. Um, and just what struck me was how passionate they are oh, definitely. about the yes. topic of making sure their communities are ready for major events. I mean, I feel better, even though none of them were from my area. I mean, most of you out there can feel very comfortable that your, your states and your counties and your cities are really have a plan together. And there's a lot of good resource information out there that you should be looking for. So uh, the first segment you did today, actually, was uh, one that was near and dear to your heart, uh, the, yes. the amateur radio, the ham radio operators. Being a ham myself, and you can take that any way you like. Yeah, I have actually been a ham radio operator for some years, and I used it in a disaster setting doing some things for Red Cross. Well, these folks went far beyond that, and they're actually incorporating ham radio into their disaster plans because they know. And I mean, I remember back when... Before we had the internet, we had Twitter and Facebook and all the rest of it. And we have to assume that may well not be there. And remembering that if there was a disaster in Hawaii or someplace far away, usually the very first communication we would get was from a ham radio operator working his rig without electricity, and, and that still exists. So now they're incorporating that into these plants. Uh, they're exercising with these folks so they can be the ones to get information out if there's if there's no other resources available and they're they're wonderful people there's lots of them they're volunteers and they've always done wonderful things for the community well let's check out that segment with let's the ham that. radio operators it was quite an animated discussion yeah, there were some animated people as they all tend to be yes. yeah here it comes hello again from beautiful atlanta georgia we're here at the nacho disaster preparedness conference with another episode of the disaster podcast I'm Sam Bradley, your host, and we have a very interesting subject today, one that's near and dear to my heart, which is ham radio, otherwise called amateur radio. And we have some experts here from three different states that we're going to talk about how we're currently using ham radio in disaster preparedness and the hospital side and, and anything else. You know, my, my recollection of ham radio, having been one for a really long time, was when there was a disaster and all communications were down, this was often the first communication that would come out of a severely impacted area was the guy, the ham guy that had, you know, a long range radio. And, and that's always kind of been the case. I assume it probably will be because people don't realize that a lot of when communications goes down, you can't get 911 on the phone, your, your cell isn't going to work. And so ham is amateur radio, whatever you prefer to call it, is still going to be a, a really necessary resource. So we have Ralph Dutcher right. from New York. Um, Rochester, New York. Rochester, New York. <laughs> Dave Cox from Oklahoma and mm -hmm. Stephen Rosberg from Utah. So we have quite a variety of folks here. So why don't you start and tell us a little about yourself, Ralph? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm Ralph Dutcher from, like I said, upstate New York, Rochester. And I'm here basically representing the Monroe County Aries Races Group. Uh, Aries Amateur Radio Emergency Services, Races Radio Amateurs Communication Services, <laughs> and uh, they're here. They're they're the the volunteer part of the amateur mm -hmm. radios that work w in a lot of public safety issues. But we find that in our county, it's really a neat way to, to coordinate what is going to go on volunteer wise uh, because they're they're a built in resource. They've already got a club going. They've already got equipment, so we can mm -hmm. just kind of tap into their expertise. And they're and, usually uh, very, very good at what they do. Yeah. So. And for full disclosure, I actually do work in public health. So <laughs> <laughs> There's that. But yes, traditionally, hams have been volunteers. I, I did Red mm. Cross work for many years doing disaster level Red Cross thing. It was a, the only means of communication we had sometimes. So, um, Dave, tell us yes. about yourself. Uh, I'm Dave Cox, uh, Deputy Director of Oklahoma City County Health Department. And as I mentioned to you before, uh, today's presentation. Uh, ham radio 
actually came first in my life. I've been licensed for over 35 years, so after 9-11, uh, being in public health at that point, it was very obvious to me that there was a place for public health to have an emergency operations center, a very uh, strong communications presence, including amateur radio. So we have spent a lot of time and a lot of effort and resources over the last 12 years or so at the health departments too that I've worked at, both in Tulsa as well as Oklahoma City, building those communications networks. And uh, my uh, part this week here at the conference is to share some of our experience uh, with others here at the conference regarding how to enhance the communications in the public health organizations. And there's about five or six steps to do that really and being a ham you all are obviously very familiar with that but uh, the first thing that I express is to develop internal capacity Mm -hmm. Get your own folks in your own agency or organization licensed and get them experienced. So you'll have that internal group that you have a little bit more control of. Right. They're probably not all going to show up if there's a major, major catastrophe because some will be affected, obviously. Um, but that'll, that'll give you a licensed core group of communicators. But also enhance or develop external capacity, as Ralph mentioned. Aries, Races, and other groups are experienced communica uh, communicators, specifically ham radio and emergency uh, uh, services sort of applications. So it's very valuable from an experience and a mentorship uh, uh, viewpoint to, to recruit and develop that external capacity. Get them training, both in licensure, get folks licensed. Also, communications training, as you know, a license does not make you a good communicator. This you is still true. need yes. uh, yeah. training, you need experience. So we encourage a lot of uh, on-air uh, operating experience for the groups that you recruit, both internal as well as external. Uh, as we all know, everything you do in this business has to be in incorporated or integrated with your emergency operations plan. Mm -hmm. That's an important step as well. Mm -hmm. And then just continue that outreach to continue to build that experience and that en enhance that your communications capabilities at your yeah. agency. Excellent. And Ralph reminded me yesterday, it's not that difficult to get a license. It used to be sure. very complicated where everybody had to learn code and that kind and of thing. And it, it's not that complicated anymore, but you, your point is very valid. It's like anything if you don't use it. I mean, right. I have a radio I still haven't figured out all the buttons on and so I I tend to not use it very often and I should really go should back. have brought it with us we could have programmed uh, it you know it, so. had I known, I would have done that. so Stephen you're from Utah uh -huh. and uh, you can tell us something about how radio is utilized in the hospital in the healthcare arena yeah. correct so, so my um, role with the health department and it's, it's we're in southwest Utah so down near Zion National Park and Bryce Canyon that's a, or in our region there's five counties 17,000 square miles so a large area that we need to cover and I'm the regional medical surge coordinator mm. for that and so we're dealing with all that medical surge component and so follow under the HPP grant is kind of where I fit in the, in the world and the ideas some of the grant guidance is inner operability communications mm -hmm. and so we've looked at various things we always do drills you know several times a year among all of our healthcare organizations um, like a couple weeks ago we had a drill we had about 70 participants doing it and we what I did was um, set up a drill and said okay we want you to communicate some information to us which happened to be number of staff you have on on call and then how many are out called out sick so just two little bits of information we wanted it communicated on a an ICS 213 form so just using oh, some yeah. of our typical things and we had responses come back um, that totaled there was 3,004 um, people that were on staff 54 were out sick you know so just kind of an interesting thing that came from our region and we had a whole variety of different groups, some that had never participated before, and it was just so just a great way to engage everybody. Sounds like um, they had a good time. They did, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and I so I I told them this is how I want you to participate, but how you communicate to me is up to you. But I want you to press yourself and do something you typically don't do, and so Ham was part of that, and um, so the, what what we've tried to do is we've done a lot of drills related to you know using our satellite phones um, and mm -hmm. one of our health our hospital administrators basically said well you know this is a horrible technology because he had to be outside and if you're waiting for a call he lives up in Panguitch um, if you know where that is it's in Perfect. Garfield County up by Bryce National Park okay. so and if it's the middle of winter it's you know zero degrees <laughs> snow on the ground and so he just didn't thought it was just bad because he had to 
have his arm up and his leg out or you know try to get a connection. On his head, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so as we continue to look through those um, communication sources, um, ham radio really pops to the top because of, of just what it can do. We have a, a lot of our healthcare facilities that are long-term care. They had equipment. Um, they had a base station and two handhelds um, that were provided by the um, the Utah um, it was the healthcare hospital association, healthcare association, and but they weren't operational. And so there's that effort. And then some of our hospitals had some ham radios, others didn't. So we uh, have a project where we're installing those in all the hospitals in our region. Um, we're, we're doing special antenna types, you know, it's an NVIS delta loop type antenna so we can have some more local propagation on different bands and so we'll begin doing more drills as those get installed. And it's, it's been a little bit of a challenge with because we're working through some volunteers and they have jobs and other lives and so it's, um, we found it's a little bit of a challenge to get the project completed because we have all the equipment, but getting it installed, it's somewhat of the scenario of the long-term care facilities where they yeah. didn't have the expertise. Some of mine was trying to just get some, we have some engineers that are part of our ARIES group. Um, great resource, but he had some other jobs <laughs> that he was doing that took some precedence for his life, which is understandable. But we're moving forward again, and we anticipate those being installed here in the next little while and um, we'll continue to do drills and hopefully be able to communicate across our region both vo over voice and digital communication is what we're, what we're working to build. Yeah. And of course every time you exercise you learn something that you Absolutely. can tweak and make it a little bit better but you know talking about the satellite radio it's just one of those things because we have an app for everything but if there's no internet what good is that going to do you as far as you're collecting information sure. on your, your hospital resources? I mean, I'm from California and we have all the fancy, you know, hospitals use different programs to collect data in a disaster and find out what the resources are, which hospitals you can take. Yeah. I work for a fire department, so, you know, we take people out of the field and, and, and take them into the hospitals. Those won't be there. Right. It may be all you have is amateur radio or, or maybe satellite, and it's a whole different bird. So, Ralph, how do you utilize it in New York? Well, Stephen made a good point, I think, when he was saying that they use both analog and digital, voice and data, yeah. because I think a lot of folks think about amateur radio as talking to one another uh, just with words. But right, uh, right. there's a, a, probably a new emerging, emergent type technology. It's been around for a while, but our club is using digital communications a lot with the programs called FL Digi. And that way we can transmit a picture of data, like a spreadsheet or a whole document or an inventory list or maybe even a medication list, which would be really difficult if you had to do it uh, over voice or, or, or even with a, a Morse code key. It would be a longer process. This way you're taking a snapshot of a, a whole lot at one time and then just squealing it out over the, the airwaves back and wow. it's going to be translated back down the other side and you're going to see exactly what was was sent from one place to another without any question about uh, the accuracy of what's being transmitted. Well, I have this vague recollection of this thing called packet radio, which I never actually did figure out what that right. was. All I knew was it utilized a computer somehow. Mm -hmm. So it's, it almost sounds like a, 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 an interesting variation from the right. radio. Use. And it's, it's very simple. I mean, you need to have a computer to make it work. So there's a blurring of technologies there. Some folks I've been talking to even today here are saying that perhaps the, that they don't appreciate the, t the computer part of the, of the hobby as much as they do the actual talking part or, or the other things. But we call, uh, in our club at least, we call amateur radio the first social media because it's basically <laughs> a way of people talking to one another and it's communicating. It's yes. And now we're becoming more sophisticated as the technology changes. So uh, to me, as an older guy that getting into the hobby, I thought it was really interesting that I could pick up, take that really simple test. I'm working on my second level right now, so I'll be able to have more capacity going further places with the networks that way. But uh, right now I can do what I need to do for our club. And we use the operators for a large degree in our point of dispensing locations. They're the alternative communication uh, that our deliverables require. So we have a number of folks. Our public health service has provided the antennas at the pod sites. And then we depend upon volunteers to come with their own gear. So it's a, a reduction of expenses that we have. And because we have a, a good re working relationship with them, actually uh, you know, a, a service provider type of relationship with the club, we can depend upon them to come out when it's necessary. And guess what? 
people like to talk on the radio, right, guys? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, give them an excuse to do that kind of thing. They'll come back out and do it again yeah. for you. So. Well, it's funny you should mention yeah. that because I remember a time when I was with my Red Cross group, and we did a lot of disaster work, but we were on a closed repeater, so it was just a bunch of us. And we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have Internet. We didn't have anything. We'd always pick up the radio, and somebody would be on it, and we knew how to get a hold of people. Right. Before work, <laughs> after work, everybody was on the radio just to talk about their day, and it was just a whole different form of communication. <laughs> It was our only form of communication, and we loved it. And you don't and have to use your minutes. Yeah, there were no <laughs> minutes. It was free air. Yes, good point. So you mentioned we talked a lot about pods yesterday, and, and they had the very interesting exercise over here, the, the lunchtime <laughs> pod exercise. So, yeah. you know, and you mentioned, too, that, you know, volunteers, and that really did start as a hobby for a lot of people, but now it's become really serious business. And you mentioned the different uh, races and, and areas and right. the different groups that are out there. And they're, they're just easy to tap into, and these folks are always willing to help out. And, and they're not the only ones you could go to. I mean, uh, Dave's in the Mars, right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, so there's a military amateur radio service. If yes. you're close to a, mm -hmm. uh, a defense, Department of Defense facility, they would be a resource for you. There's uh, faith-based groups out there. The Salvation Army has mm -hmm. a group called Saturn. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, amateur radio is, is in a lot of different places. I mean, the slogan that always comes back to me is when all else fails, there's amateur radio. That's the truth, yes. You know, Battery-operated uh, portable equipment you can depend upon. And we talked yesterday about the field day exercises that I remember so well and the whole point was in a disaster you're not going to have electricity and so mm -hmm. the hams would get together and find a high point and put up their antennas and get their battery powered radios and see how far they could get out and see how many contacts they could make and that was a lot of fun but mm -hmm. there was a serious point to it you were actually exercising for a disaster and, mm -hmm. and that's worked very well hence the need for for ham radios now so Steve, how would they learn more about your system? And if people have, you may, this may reach some of your local folks that might want to get involved. Yeah, well, hopefully they know about it because I try to attend the ten club meetings. <laughs> you and, found and, them and, all. And, and, you? Well, no, there's always somebody that doesn't show up or is not active at a point. So you have to continue to reach out. Um, probably the best source is, is on the, 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 um, the Preparedness Summit's website. And there's a ham radio section in there. Um, it has all of our information, I think, for each of us there. Right. Oh, good. And the idea is that um, I think we'll have our presentations that will be posted there after, because we did a, uh, a presentation on Tuesday that talked about the different aspects of some of the more details about what we've talked about today. So there's that, or so that's probably the best source. Um, I guess our local website is the swhealth.org, so that would be another source to be able to find me for the southwestutahhealth.org is okay. what that is, and that would be a good place. We'll be, be sure to get that link so we can, Jamie can add it into the show notes. So Dave, anything you'd like to add? Where can people find you, or what's well, a good reference information? As, as Steve mentioned, uh, our, this, I guess this podcast plus our presentations will be on uh, a link yes. uh, from the Nature website as well Correct. as your website. Um, We've advertised quite a bit regarding the issues or the sessions that we're actually doing here this week on in QST Magazine, CQ yeah, Magazine, and several other resources that ham radio operators have access to. Uh, local organizations in my uh, part of the country are certainly familiar with our operation. Uh, we've uh, partnership with a lot of the local clubs in our in our area uh, to help provide uh, additional resources bo both from the standpoint of local with VHF and UHF capability as well as HF for long distance communications. Uh, one of the things that uh, we plan to promote after this, uh, I visited with NACHO somewhat, is a couple of, of national networks. Uh, one was established by the CDC called the National Public Health uh, Radio Network which actually uses federal frequencies, the CDC's licensure mm -hmm. capability for public health, state health departments, as well as local health departments. And we're replicating that same model using ham radio operators, ham radio frequency, and amateur radio equipment in a program called HAMS and Public Health. So we'll be Excellent. contacting, uh, again, we've already contacted several hundred health departments around the country, but we'll be expanding that uh, outreach to try to get uh, ham radio operators working in public health or hospital mm -hmm. or health care coalitions as well as public health to be a part of that network uh, where we can establish uh, national as well as local and regional communications networks that will be uh, invaluable uh, during events. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, one, one thing uh, you, you sort of touched on since we in public health and health care really 
become first responders since 9-11, uh, we're all very familiar with exercise, 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 and drills, just tons and tons of them. We've been doing that in ham radio for mm -hmm. 50 sure. years. You mentioned uh, yes, field day. Yeah. There's, there's over 700,000 ham radio operators licensed in the, in the United States. Wow. Over 7,000 clubs. So when we have health, when we have field day, as you mentioned, which is the last weekend in June, last full weekend, there's literally thousands of ham radio operators representing thousands of clubs that deploy to the field with emergency uh, power sources. And we're literally doing an exercise or a drill for 24 hours operating that equipment, yeah. hoping that we can make as many contacts as we can. If something breaks, we fix it. That's part of the exercise to make sure that we continue that that uh, form of communications. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, as you mentioned in the beginning of this podcast, and, and as Ralph mentioned, when all else fails, amateur radio gets through. And there's reasons for that, and you touched on it. The infrastructures on almost all of the other forms of communications will be down or severely compromised. Ham radio is, is uh, decentralized, portable power. There's tons of ham radio operators willing and able to, to volunteer to help you continue your communications capabilities. Uh, for us, it's a primary source of communications for some of the aspects of our pod operations. Mm -hmm. It's secondary to some, and it's certainly backup for any, uh, any of our operation and all of our operations. And I have to say that to the hands, we appreciate you. I mean, all the work you do, like you said, even when they're not involved in your operation, they're out there learning mm -hmm. everything they need to know. They're, they're drilling, they're exercising. So I would ask you too, Ralph, I would ask the same question, but what if someone's interested in becoming a ham? Where do they go to find out what they need to do? Well, there's a couple of easy ways to do it. You could go to the American Radio Relay League's website. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good starting point right there, and they actually have... You don't need to join it. You can go over to a part on the website where it says, are you new to ham radio? And it'll just give you a way to walk right through at that point, give you some chances to look up your local club and contact them. Uh, I was going to say, if how are we get in contact with us, I'm going to drop a couple of, of good ones on you at this point. Please during, do. During the radio, um, during our, our radio weekend in June, the last weekend of June, if you tune into W2EOC, that happens to be our station in Rochester, ah. New York, okay? We're one of the EOC stations out there, and you actually get a few extra points if you catch EOC emergency <laughs> operations stations. So go to W2EOC, or did I say that three times already? And Or if you want to, you could also go it's out easy to, our, to remember. our website, which is Monroe County MCOM, all one word, M-O-N-R-O-E-E-M-C-O-M-M.org, and that's our webpage, and you can see a lot of stuff. We actually put on a, a, a little bit of, of a all-day activity in the fall called MCOM East. And if you're interested in the area, feel free to come around. Uh, it's an all-day uh, session on emergency communications put on by people in the field and, and people that have their hands into this sort of thing. So it's not all public health, but it's all, it's all public service. That way, so. Well, it's funny, too, because this shows something about yeah, hands, because you got three guys in three different states, and they all know each other, and you understand what you, you know each other does, and I think that's pretty cool. Don't ask me what their call signs are, though. I haven't got that memory. <laughs> I have yeah. to remember mine. Most. <laughs> well, as much as I love to talk about this all day, and we certainly could, I guess we have to give some time to somebody else today. So we will <laughs> have to call this a day. So thank about you for 73. being with us. 73. 73. Oh, that? good point. That's what you see at the end of a call. But, so thanks for being here at the Disaster Podcast. I thank all my guests for giving us some really good information. We're hoping that we might inspire some of you to go out and get your license and be a part of uh, the, the public health effort in a disaster. And this will be it for us for this segment of the Disaster Podcast. This is your host, Sam Bradley, and we usually end with uh, disaster medicine is not your everyday medicine, but in this case we're adding on to the tagline that emergency preparedness is everyone's responsibility and the hands have certainly taken their share of that. So we'll see you soon. Sam, Sam I have to tell you that was just an amazing um, discussion. Uh, these fine. guys really have put an infrastructure in place to uh, serve their communities, and it's all done on a volunteer basis. It always has been, and, and you have to give them credit for, I mean, years and years I've, I've known hams that that's what they do. They serve the community. That's really, I mean, you talk about ham radio, yeah, they like to talk to each other, but when it hits the fan, they're there. 
And it's a resource that I think a lot of people forget is there. And, and it's nice to see that these organizations and cities and counties and are actually utilizing them in their plans because when it hits the fan, they're gonna be the first ones there. And I like their commitment to being prepared, that mm -hmm. they, they train, they regularly get together, they actually have annual events yes, they where they make sure that they are they mm -hmm. are able to get their radio transmissions out from their communities so that they can communicate with the outside world. And they do that without electricity, and that's kind of the intent because they know the likelihood of that being there. Well, so they work on battery-powered radios and apparatus and antennas, and, and they're ready to go. And, you know, we, that preparation is so important at all levels of, of the response, whether it's community response and volunteers or organized response services like our local EMS fire and what and police mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where people like our partners Paragon Medical Education Group come in is that yes. the, the folks at Paragon Joe and Jim and the rest of them um, really bring a unique educational resource in that gets you set with real life scenarios real life drills and setups so that you are really prepared not just the the thought process or the the, the situations where you sit in a boring lecture and get killed by powerpoint, Death by PowerPoint right? yes. i mean <laughs> this they actually you know they limit their powerpoint and they want you to be hands-on they want you to get out there and do real things and i can't say enough about their educational experience that they put out there um, so check out Paragon Medical Education Group. They are our partners in the Disaster Podcast. They make it possible for us to bring this show to you each week. You can find them over at paragonmedicalgroup.com and also on Twitter at paragonmededu. So check them out and follow them and thank them for helping yeah. um, to bring the Disaster Podcast to you. Good guys doing good stuff and we can't and we just wish they were here but they're not so well, we we'll hopefully we'll have them, them here next year. I hope so. Yeah, definitely. So uh, that's it for this episode. We do want to make sure you're checking out all of our shows over at disasterpodcast.com. There's information over there on how you can subscribe to the show and iTunes and other resources. But also, we want you to become an active member of the community. So leave a comment in the comments area for each episode or article over there. You can leave that comment. It emails us. We will get back to you, and we can have a discussion. Maybe you have a resource you'd like us to have on a future episode, mm -hmm. somebody to interview. Whatever the case may be, make this a community effort, and that means that you need to contribute too. And really check out these episodes, because at the end of each episode, we have really good resource information. NATO alone, I mean, you mentioned that in your last podcast, that they keep going back to, you know, it's on the NATO site, it's on the NATO site. So a lot of good resource information, and, and please do prepare yourself, because you never know what the next one's going to be like or what's going to happen. And as much as we like to think it won't ever happen, it's just really a matter of when. Yeah, it really is. Sam, where can folks find you? Well, Sam Bradley pretty much anywhere. Sam Bradley on Facebook, Sam Bradley uh, 11 on Twitter, and uh, certainly on the disasterpodcast.com website. And you can find me under the handle Podmedic just about everywhere you look, so find me there. And also, of course, all of our shows from my various programs and others available for you over at the ProMed Network at promednetwork.com. Wealth of knowledge there, yes. Excellent. Um, Sam, you want to take us out? Yes, as we say in the disaster world, disaster medicine is not your everyday medicine, but disaster preparedness is everyone's responsibility. <laughs>